I'll just wait for a minute. I'll wait for attendees to join in and then introduce the webinar. Hello, everyone. Bee Waste Wise, along with Beyond Food Waste, brings you this webinar on measuring food waste, the global FLW standard. Uh, we have Heis Langeveld, uh, who is a longtime moderator at Bee Waste Wise, moderating this conversation. He's a managing director at Polymer Science Park and principal consultant at Project Heis BV. Today, he's going to talk to Brian Lipinski, research associate of the food program at World Resources Institute. And I just, as usual, just letting you all know that uh, Heist will be taking questions, Brian will be taking questions. Please use the Q&A section to drop your questions. If you have any comments, please feel free to use chat. If you want to introduce yourself, definitely use chat. And the other information is that this webinar will be recorded. It will be up on uh, the Be Waste Wise YouTube as well as the Be Waste Wise website and the Beyond Food Waste website. So over to you, Heis. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to have you here. Um, and, um, uh, and, and to have uh, Brian Lipinski here to have uh, Sweeta here, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, very uh, uh, glad that we can discuss um, uh, the next theme on food waste, which is about measuring food waste. And uh, today we will be discussing uh, the global um, food loss and waste accounting and reporting standard, uh, which has been developed by, uh, by the World Resource Institute and, and partners. And uh, well, Brian will tell you all about it today. Um, uh, and um, uh, personally, I found a very interesting standard um, because um, it gives a, a common language and clear requirements. And uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a restaurant, a farm, a retailer, a manufacturer, a city or a country, uh, but this is a standard that allows you to develop an inventory based on specific needs and goals. So that's great. Uh, we'll be having uh, three sections today in how we're discussing it. Uh, first, uh, Brian will tell us something about the progress uh, uh, on, on the report of the Sustainable Development Goals and, and give a sense of what is happening now globally. Then the second part is more technically and we go into the protocol and, 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 and um, uh, we have a deep dive there. The third part is uh, about uh, what, uh, what Brian called 10, 20, 30. Uh, which are examples of companies who are taking action. So um, that's our program for today. And, and at, at the end of each section, I would like to have a short Q&A section uh, with uh, you as the audience. Uh, and maybe I, I've got a question myself as well to Brian. So, um, but uh, enough about us. Um, uh, I think before we move on to the presentation, um, uh, just a short reminder that you can use the Q&A section for your questions, uh, and uh, we will try to, uh, to, uh, to accommodate and, and uh, discuss them all. Um, all right, enough about this. Uh, let's move towards uh, uh, Brian. Brian, very, well, hard well, uh, very warm welcome here. Uh, can you please some tell something to the audience? Uh, first about yourself and your background uh, and your relationship with uh, with uh, food uh, waste and uh, and loss and waste. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me. So thanks for joining everyone. Hi, I'm Brian Lipinski from the World Resources Institute, as uh, they've said. And so this is very um, already laid out the structure of today's presentation really well. So thank you guys for that. Um, so I've been with the World Resources Institute since 2009, working in our food program, and I address food waste in um, a number of different ways, which we're actually going to touch on each of them in today's presentation. So just to give you a little sense of who I am and who WRI is, in case you're not familiar with us. So WRI, the World Resources Institute, we're a global research organization, a nonprofit that works at the intersection of environment, economic well being, and human well being. And so I'm based in Washington, D.C., which was our original office. But as you can see, we now have offices all over the world. We have about 1,600 employees um, at WRI. And I'm part of our food program, as I've said, which is just one area of our work. We also work on climate, energy, forests, water, oceans, um, all sorts of different issues, but uh, I'm lucky enough to be looking at food specifically. 
And so um, we've done quite a bit of work on food systems and food loss and waste specifically. So as Thais already mentioned, we're the Secretariat for the Food Loss and Waste Protocol, which I'll get into a bit more later on. We're also the Secretariat for Champions 12.3, which is a coalition of executives from the public and private sectors who are dedicated to mobilizing action around achieving um, what we call the Sustainable Development Goal Target 12.3, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment, and um, really just trying to motivate action on food loss and waste. And then we've also authored a number of leading food loss and waste publications that have helped to set the global agenda on this topic. And so, as we've mentioned, there'll be three parts. We'll have a little bit of Q&A after each one. We're first talking about the Global Food Loss and Waste Challenge and SDG 12.3 and what sort of progress there's been towards that. Then the more technical piece on that Food Loss and Waste Protocol. And then finally, the 10 by 20 by 30 initiative and how companies are taking action on food loss and waste. So getting started, I think it's helpful just to understand the scale of this issue and why this is so important. So about, by our best estimates, about one third of all food is lost or wasted each year somewhere from farm to fork. It could be even higher than that, actually, based on more recent estimates, but that's the, the most globally accepted figure. That costs the global economy about $940 billion each year, and about 8% of annual greenhouse gas emissions can be associated with food loss and waste. And so just to put that in perspective, if you had a country that was producing all of the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with food loss and waste, it would be the world's third largest greenhouse gas emitter after China and the US. So pretty significant. Um, so that brings us to the SDG 12.3, as I'll be calling it, the Sustainable Development Goal Target 12.3. So the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by the United Nations member states um, and address all sorts of different areas of sustainability, not just environmental sustainability, but social, economic, um, a wide range of topics. But specifically, Sustainable Development Goal 12 is about responsible consumption and production. And then there's this sub-target, Target 12.3, that aims to cut global food waste in half by 2030. So a really ambitious goal. Um, but a really important one, as we've seen, based on uh, how significant of an issue this is. And so one of the things we do as part of our role of, of the Secretariat of this group, Champions 12.3, is that we release an annual progress report that shows how the world is doing um, in, this, um, in this goal towards that 50% reduction. And one of the things we've done as a part of this annual progress report is that we have a series of milestones where we rank countries and governments and companies based on the progress they're making towards um, three, three areas, which we call target, measure, and act. Target means setting that target, setting that 50% reduction target. Measure means that you're actively measuring the food loss and waste that's happening either in your country or your company. And then act, of course, is the most important part. You're taking action to actually reduce the food loss and waste. And so for companies and governments, we rate them on a sort of red, yellow, green traffic light scale of are, are you meeting, are you where you need to be? Are you sort of halfway but not quite doing enough? Or is it really not enough's happening, we really need to ramp up the efforts. Um, and so this was from the previous set of milestones, 2019 to 2021, where we found that um, generally, neither governments nor companies are quite doing enough. There are isolated examples of progress, and this isn't to say that there isn't activity happening, but more countries need to be doing more, more companies need to be doing more. So here we see that um, the, the, the milestones around setting a target, some countries have done this, some companies have done this, we still need more to be taking place. Um, in terms of measurement, 
countries generally are not doing enough on measurement at this stage. We need more country level measurement of food loss and waste. And the reason why this is so important is because measurement helps to drive your action. So action is what's most important, but if you're not measuring, you don't know where to target your efforts and you don't know if you're making progress over time. And so that's why we think that this Target Measure Act approach is so important. And so here we can see that governments are not quite doing the measurement they need to be doing. Companies are a bit better and they're working with their suppliers as well, which is a positive um, sign of progress, but we still need a bit more movement in, in that space. And then finally, in terms of action, um, the milestones here were that we were aiming for countries with 40% of the global population to be actively working at scale to reduce food loss and waste. So yeah, anywhere you see that, that acronym FLW, that stands for food loss and waste. Um, and also we are hoping to see that a country would have already managed to hit that 50% reduction target. Neither of those happened in the previous term. Um, and then in terms of action, we do see a bit more happening on the company side. So um, the world's largest food companies do actually have active food loss and waste reduction programs, and, and many are starting to work with their suppliers even more. Um, one thing that's exciting about this year's progress report, you'll notice that these were the years 2019 to 2021. We are moving into that next set of milestones. So this year's progress report will be um, especially notable in terms of this update. And so then the other component of this progress report was that we covered five of the top food loss and waste stories of 2021. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here just for the sake of time, but I would encourage you to take a look at the progress report to learn a bit more about these if any of them pique your interest. So the first was that the World Bank developed what's called a food smart country diagnostic where for five countries, they took a look at um, what interventions in terms of food loss and waste would be most effective, both in terms of what commodities, what food types should be focused on, and then where in the food supply chain it would be most effective to take action. So that's a really unique. We haven't seen that level of specificity just yet in terms of these sorts of interventions. So this is hopefully a positive step forward and we'll see more of these in the future. Um, another was that new global measurements on food loss and waste suggest that it's actually occurring at a larger scale than we previously thought. Um, so this is obviously not a, a happy development, um, but what we discovered um, via some new measurements, this actually came out of the UN Environment Program was that consumer food waste is more significant than has been previously estimated. It's previously been seen that um, consumer food waste is more of a US and Europe sort of problem. And actually what the their study found was that it's not just um, the US and Europe, it's actually quite widespread that consumer food waste is higher than we previously thought. So this really informs the sort of activities that we need to take in the future to achieve that 50% reduction goal. Um, and that actually ties in well with this next development, which was the Chinese food waste law. So in China, they passed a new law that was really targeted at reducing consumer food waste. And so there were penalties and fines for things like overeating and over ordering of food. Um, we don't know yet if this is going to be effective. We don't know yet if this is actually going to be enforced or if it's more of a symbolic sort of law. So this is one to watch to see if this makes a dent in terms of food waste at the consumer side of things. Um, a fourth development is that there is in, there are increasing private sector efforts to reduce food loss and waste. And I'm actually going to talk about that more in the third part of the presentation, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much here. But there is some innovative stuff happening both within companies and also with how companies collaborate amongst each other. 
And then finally, the fifth development was the ongoing effects of COVID-19. Um, I'm sure I don't need to dwell on this too much. We're all aware of how COVID-19 has affected not just the food systems, but all aspects of our lives. And so, of course, it's worth examining how that's um, affected food loss and waste, how it's given shocks to the food system, and how we can better adapt to hopefully not shocks on the scale of COVID-19 going forward, but these sort of unexpected events that might cause increased amounts of um, food loss and waste. So these were five of the top stories that we pulled out as being significant in this previous calendar year. Um, we'll have this next progress report coming out in September of this year. And you can find the all the progress reports. We've been putting them out every year since 2015 at uh, champions12123.org. Um, so if any of those are, are of interest to you, I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so that's the, the first sort of setting the stage of where we are in terms of food loss and waste globally. Um, after this, I'm going to go into that more technical component of the food loss and waste protocol, but I think we should pause here for any questions that may have come up just in that opening section. Well, that's 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 a nice, a great overview, Brian. Um, uh, and I think there are some key uh, messages there. To to start with, the last thing that you said about COVID nineteen, there is a question about that from Derek Grady. Hi, Derek. Great to have you here. Uh, and his question is, uh, what is the impact on the progress, uh, or what impact do you uh, on progress do you expect? Uh, that the pan pandemic uh, uh, will have on, on food waste and loss. So there is this pandemic, sure, but what is the impact actually on, on, uh, on, on this issue? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's a question that's still a little bit open and it's also a bit mixed. So what we've seen in some areas, especially in the private sector, is that COVID-19 presented a sort of all-encompassing um, concern where they had to divert all their sort of free attention to how they were going to deal with this. And so in some instances that was production plants where they had to close down facilities because everyone was getting sick. In other cases, it was that some food was being produced, but it didn't have a destination to go to because of restaurants or grocery stores or whoever else, whatever end user, not um, functioning in the same way and not buying up those products in the same way. So those actually can lead to higher levels of food loss and waste. We also did see from some evidence that during instances of lockdown, consumer food waste fell where <clears throat> people were cooking at home more, they were making better use of what they were already purchasing because they didn't want to they didn't want to or couldn't make as many trips to purchase food. And um, yeah, it just seemed to promote some better habits. But the concerning aspect of that is that once lockdowns started to be lifted, those rates sort of returned right to where they were beforehand. And so it doesn't seem like those habits became permanently ingrained. It seems more that they were a temporary adaptation to the circumstances. So we'll, we're still sort of waiting to see how much of an effect COVID-19 has had on companies and if they've been able to have prog make progress still, but it's uh, on, on balance, I would say it's probably been a bit of a setback. All right. Um, the one question that I had was about, uh, well, you're saying that more movement is needed and to a certain extent measurement drives uh, the action. Can you explain a little bit more on how that works? What What is the relation between the measuring and the action actually? Sure, I think this will hopefully come out a little bit in the next section as well. But the way I see it is that measurement drives action because I, the reason food loss and waste is such a tricky issue is that no one country, no one company, no one household is going to experience it the same way. So 
you can't just apply the same policies across the board or the same interventions and hope that that will be successful because you know every co country has their own commodity that they are um specialized in and then those commodities all have sort of different interventions in terms of what's going to be effective in terms of reducing food loss and waste so in some places it's going to be things like you need increased cold storage in others it might be that you need improved infrastructure so that food doesn't have to travel as far or has an easier trip to travel um, in some places it's going to be more about reducing consumer food waste and so measurement is important in that it helps you to understand where you need to target your your action yeah okay great and uh, then i've got another question coming up from uh, from the audience uh, and that is about one of your sheets uh, what do you mean specifically with countries with 40 percent or population does it mean that you only consider the countries with the largest amounts of population so for this metric, that's just to track sort of overall progress on, on action. So this is just one way of cutting that, that number. So it, it does not mean that only large populations are significant. It's just one way of trying to understand um, where, how much progress is being made. And so in those progress reports, we also have maps that show which countries are, are doing each of these steps so there's quite a bit more information available beyond that this is just yeah. one way of slicing up that that data all right and final question that's more like a practical one uh, which comes up here is is um from manta jan and she asked are he, uh, like uh, can we have a link to the to these progress reports are these available or not online yes so oh, at perfect. um yeah, champions123.org um, is where you'll find those. So, okay. and if you just Google champions 12.3, you can find it that way as well. Great. Um, okay, well, thanks. Uh, I would suggest that we move towards the, the next section uh, about the, the protocol. Um, I see that the link has already been updated by Sweeta. So, thanks for that. Oh, great. Thank you, Sweeta. Okay. Well, so now we're going to move into a bit more about that measurement aspect and a little bit more of a technical component, but hopefully not too, uh, too dry or too <laughs> serious. So the food loss and waste protocol, as we've already talked about a little bit, is a, um, or, so there's the protocol, people say the protocol or the standard, you can say either really. Um, WRI in conjunction with the UN, FAO, a number of other food waste organizations, um, we developed this, this accounting and reporting standard. And so what this aims to do is provide common language, provide a standardized way to summarize what we call an FLW inventory, which is basically just the output of measurement. It offers practical guidance, and it's really trying to be adaptive to your situation and not overly prescriptive. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So what the standard tries to help you do is it walks you through a number of steps that can be sort of combined into four questions. So first, why are you quantifying? What are you hoping to get out of this measurement process? Next, what are you going to quantify? What are you actually going to measure? How do you go about doing it? You know, what methods are you going to use? And then finally, how do you report that? How do you share that information publicly and then um, move progress from there? So each of these little boxes is a separate chapter within the standard. And so again, like with the progress reports, I would encourage you, if any of this, um, you know, this we have 10, 15 minutes to go over this, it's quite complex in some areas. So if there's anything that's especially of interest to you, I would encourage you to take a look at the, the standard itself. I'll be showing the link for that in a moment. And also I'm happy to take questions over email if we don't get to it today. So this is actually a great moment to stop and understand what we're talking about when we say food waste or food loss and waste. So at the top of this diagram, 
you can see we have all of the food plants, fungi, and animals that are intended for human consumption. So this is everything that we produce that it's intended for people to eat. We're not talking about plants grown for bioenergy. We're not talking about plants originally grown for animal feed. We're just talking about what's intended for humans. Then from there, you can split that into food and what we call inedible parts. And so food is the stuff that's intended for me to eat and for you to eat and be nourishing and nutritious and healthy, hopefully. Um, inedible parts are things like bones and pits and rinds that are just not intended for you to eat, but are they come along with the food anyway. You can't have the food without having those parts. So that's also part of this. So then what we hope for is that on the far left of this, the food gets consumed, that it ends up being eaten by people. But if it's not, you have this yellow box where this is everywhere where the food could go if it's not ultimately eaten by a person. So this is this is where it gets a bit technical, but I think it's a really important point because I think when we talk about food waste, we all tend to picture, you know, a landfill or a trash can filled with food, but it can be quite a, an array of other things where it could be that the food is actually diverted to um, something like animal feed where there is some energy recovered. It's not a complete loss, but it still hasn't fed a human, which ideally it would. Whereas something like landfill is never really good. We don't really ever want food to go there, and it's absolutely not an effective use of that food. And so we call these the destinations. And just to, I think the next slide is, oh, and so this is an important point as well, which is that the standard actually allows you to determine what combination of material types and destinations you consider to be food loss and waste. There's not a ton of agreement around which of these is actually considered to be waste and which isn't. There's a hierarchy, which I'll show in a moment, but the this is what I mean about the standard being adaptive, is that it allows you to identify which of these areas are of focus for you. And there's a more specific definition for each of these within the standard. For the sake of our conversation today and for the sake of time, I, I decided not to um, go into those really technical definitions, but there's a much more in-depth definition of each of these within the standard. And so just to break this down a little bit more of what each of those means. So what, what do we mean when we say material type? Again, food is any substance that is intended for human consumption. This includes drinks. This includes ingredients. So, you know, we don't usually sit around and eat flour, but flour is baked into bread. So flour would be considered a, a food substance. Again, inedible parts are things that are not intended to be consumed by humans. Um, things like an apple's core or the bones of a chicken. But what's considered inedible varies based on culture and context. So things that we don't eat in the US, people do elsewhere in the world. Um, and probably we should be. <laughs> and just to make this point extra clear, because inedible can be a confusing term, um, I'm sorry to show you this unpleasant image of a, <laughs> a banana that's gone off. But uh, it's an important point. So the 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 Banana on the top there is inedible. It is food that is no longer edible, but it was intended for human consumption at some point. So it's still food. It's just don't eat that. <laughs> we no longer want that to be something you consume, but it's not considered inedible parts. It's considered food because it was originally intended to be food. Whereas the inedible parts, in this case, the banana, it's the peel. Um, you weren't going to eat that peel, um, but you were going to eat the inside of the banana. And so that's the distinction here, is that the peel is inedible parts. It's something that comes along with the banana. We can't have the banana without having the peel at some point. But ined inedible food could be something like bread that's gotten moldy. 
certainly not saying you should be eating that, but it was intended for human consumption at some point. And so the standard allows you to say if you're going to look at just food or if you're going to look at food and inedible parts. And then again, the destinations, we have the full list here of everything that was in that box. Destinations are essentially where food loss and waste goes when it's removed from the human food supply chain, when it doesn't get consumed by people. And as I've referenced, not all of these destinations are created equal, and some of them have higher associated impacts than others. And I just want to really hammer home the point of why this is significant that to understand the material type and the destinations. So this is just an example from the United States where there were two separate agencies that were um, measuring food waste and were coming up with very different numbers. And so the US Department of Agriculture, the USDA, was looking at food and then all of these destinations that have a check mark next to it. And that was their definition of food waste. Then the US Environmental Protection Agency was coming up with a very different number. So the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, was saying that there was 66.5 million tons of food waste in the US. Then the US EPA was saying that it was 36.46 million tons. That's a very different number. And what we had to realize was that the EPA was then looking at a much smaller subset of those destinations. They were including inedible parts, but they were only looking at landfill and combustion. And so that's why this idea of scope and destinations is really significant because it can really alter what you're talking about and what comparisons you're making. And also these destinations, as I've referenced, are just not all created equal. So in this diagram, the red destinations or the orange or red boxes are where there's really no value recovered when food goes there. So if you're sending food to a landfill or a sewer or to just a pile of refuse or discards, you're not getting anything back from that. It truly is just entirely a waste. When we're getting into this yellow section, where we're looking at things like composting and anaerobic digestion, land application, you can get some value recovered from that food loss and waste. So when you apply food back into the land, land application as fertilizer, or if it gets plowed back into the soil, um, you're getting something back because it's helping to fertilize the soil for the next generation of crops or if you're sending it to compost or anaerobic digestion, you might be getting some sort of energy recovery from that. Then when we're getting into these green destinations like animal feed and bio-based materials and processing, um, which refers to creating new products from the, the food loss and waste, that's generally seen as a more positive place for this, things to go if food has to leave the human food supply chain. So this is another one of these things where it's a hierarchy, it's a spectrum of least desirable to generally more desirable. But as the arrows are showing, we really want to move things out of those yellow, orange, red boxes back into the food supply chain, ideally, at the very top of this diagram. Or if we have to send something, if it can't reach humans, you're trying to aim for something that's in the higher level of the hierarchy, something that's a bit more of a recovery. And so this is where the standard is really comes in as being helpful is that if you're not measuring and you don't know where the food loss and waste is going, you don't know which of these destinations you're sending things to, again, you just don't know where to target your actions. So that's why, again, highest reference going back to your question before about why is measurement so important, um, it just gives you that extra toolkit to understand what's happening within your country, your company, your city, and to target your actions appropriately. Um, so the FLW protocol, there's flwprotocol.org, the link is on the top of the page there. There's a wealth of resources available here. 
Um, on the home page, you can find the executive summary, which again has those definitions and a great deal more information about the standard. Um, there's also the full standard in various languages. And then there's a number of case studies, there are a number of tools and resources available. And I'd just like to point out a couple of those resources that you can find. So one is um, specifically for companies, but it's about connecting food loss and waste to greenhouse gas emissions and understanding um, the impact of food loss and waste within a company's operations and how that ties to their greenhouse gas emissions, their GHG output. Um, this is very recent. And even if you're not with a company, there's still a lot of great information in there that is relevant to the idea of connecting food loss and waste and GHGs. And then there's also what we call the FLW value calculator on the website. And what this is, is a downloadable Excel tool that allows you to estimate the value of food loss and waste in terms of various um, environmental impacts, nutritional impacts. Um, you can put in the weight of food loss and waste, the type of product and where you are in the world, and even the destinations that it's going to. And it will give you information about the associated environmental and nutritional impacts of that. So another great tool in terms of taking what can feel very abstract in terms of amounts of food loss and waste and turning it into something more specific and concrete. And again, helping to understand the impacts and helping that measurement to drive further action. Um, so that was very much an overview of the standard. Um, again, I'm sure that probably you have questions right now. You might have questions that pop up in the future. We don't talk about it today. Please feel free to reach out to me, um, but let's take as many questions as we can now. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, I think uh, you may, even if it's somewhere a bit technical, I think you make a, a, you you give it a very uh, a good picture on on what are the important things and what comes out of the technical part, which is interesting for others. Um, my my first question would be: Is that you're talking about edible parts and non-edible parts? To what extent does that influence the way that you measure? things or is, is, is that is that something that you should account for or not or, or how, how do you deal with that difference? That's a great question. So it really depends on what your goals are. Um, and this actually gets to why the, the US the Department of Agriculture had a different approach to that than the Environmental Protection Agency. So if you're just trying to look at food and getting more people to have more food, then you would probably just look at the food component and you wouldn't be as concerned with the inedible parts. But the flip side of that is that inedible parts still need to go somewhere. There still needs to be something done with them. And so that's why you had the distinction where the Department of Agriculture was only concerned about how much food was reaching people. Whereas the Environmental Protection Agency was concerned about the land and resources that were being devoted to this waste disposal, which would still include the inedible parts. And so that's where the distinction can fit in. I think from my personal perspective is that food should be the primary focus and inedible parts are, you know, we, they're going to happen no matter what, we're, we can't avoid them. But ideally, we'd be sending those to the best use possible as well. But that for this 50% reduction goal, especially, I think that food should be the primary focus there. Okay, so moving over to, to the questions of the audience. Uh, the first one is from Mamta Jane. And the question is, where does uh, do it yourself or, or uh, they, I, why grow your own food fall in this whole uh, food loss and waste uh, context, uh, like in the, um, in, in, how, how, is there a way that you measure it or do you include it in, in your system? So this system can be used by, by really anyone. Um, it, it's not dependent on size or scale. 
we would just consider that another aspect of production in terms of the production side of the food supply chain. So the standard itself is quite agnostic about, you know, if this is a large company using it, a small grower. I would say probably if you're just growing food in your backyard or a relatively small grower, you might have a sense of what's happening and what sort of um, approaches you need to be taking without going through a full sort of um, exercise like this. I would, but um, it, it's clearly an important part of the system. It's just probably easier to wrap your head around what's happening in your in your smaller DIY sort of plot without going through a large exercise like this, the standard might direct you toward. Okay, um, uh, thanks. Um, the next question is from Derek Reedy and he, uh, his question popped up with, uh, with uh, the, the hierarchy of uh, various ways, the slide on hierarchy. And his question is, what about the energy from utilization of land gas and the digestion of sewage sludge? Is that included in the system, in, in the hierarchy or how, how do you look at that? Yeah, I'll bring it back up. So yes, if there's energy recovery, it would be in one of these sort of co-digestion or anaerobic digestion or yeah, or aerobic digestion or land application. It'd be in one of these sort of yellow boxes where there is some energy recovery. So if it's, it's showing up a little bit orange for me, but that bottom either red or orange, that's where we're saying there's no energy recovery. If you're in the yellow boxes, you're getting some energy recovery and if you're in the green, you're getting a little bit more than in the yellow. This is all general. This is, you know, stretched out to the a large view, a, a very high view. So this shouldn't be taken as absolutely one of these is always better than the other. But generally, this is the approach is that the yellow gets some energy recovery, the red gets none, and then the green gets a bit more. Okay, thanks. I have a question from Glenn Goodwin, um, um, uh, and, she, and, and the question is, is there any company or organization doing household food loss and waste measurement well? Yeah, so in terms of um, who's doing household food loss and waste measurement well, I would say the gold standard is the organization RAP in the UK, W-R-A-P. They publish um, regular household estimates of food loss and waste data in the United Kingdom. So I would say they're definitely the, the place to go for that. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, and, and Rep was also early on in our series and there, there they explained to this, their, their approach. Um, Brian, um, how reliable is the, the food loss and waste calculator considering that emissions are dependent upon the climatic uh, conditions at least? Um, yeah, that, that's a great point. And it's, there's plenty of caveats in the calculator itself about, um, you know, what other factors come into it. It really is about getting a best estimate and getting a sense of the relative impacts of things more than necessarily being an exact um, amount. So I think it's probably most useful in terms of understanding things like the relative impact of maybe of different destinations or of different commodity types um, and then giving you a general sense of the impacts based on the best data that we have available but of course there's always going to be that sort of regional variation and other factors that come into play i just wanted to know uh one of the questions on beforehand uh, was about uh, about island states um, uh, how, how, is there any aspect in the standard that, uh, that should be eliminated or pertains to, to island state specific? Um, I don't think there's anything that would be specific to island states. I think generally, again, we're trying to be very adaptive to the circumstances. So perhaps some of these destinations won't apply in a small island state, there might not be digesters, for example, or there might not be a compost system set up. In that case, you wouldn't be looking at those aspects of the destinations. But in general, you can 
look at the standard and, and see what suits your situation best. So this is similar to the question about, you know, large companies using it versus smaller companies, large countries versus smaller countries. It's really about adapting it to your own circumstances. And there's lots of information that um, helps to do that. All right, two, two more questions and then we move towards the next subject. Uh, I think uh, uh, they can be answered quite uh, to the point. And the first one is, did the slides mention the ratio of edible versus inedible food? Or can you say something about that ratio? About, uh, and is it different in different countries or, or is it similar everywhere? It's a good question. So it it's something that uh, I don't know. I don't think we have enough data to say that there's yeah. There's just not enough measurement taking place to say specifically if we we know if there's a big difference between different countries. Um, I do know that specifically in the U.S., we have the USDA actually publishes a table full of different types of food products and then what percentage of that is food versus what percentage of it is not so there are resources out there available but in terms of that more global split and driving any insights of you know is there a part of the world that has much more inedible portions maybe because they eat more of the food um i i would love to have that data and i hope that we'll have that data as more countries start to measure but I, I just haven't seen it yet. I can understand. We you can make assumptions, but it's not measured. Actually, right. so uh, final question for this part uh, is from Sian Kufri Young, and the question is: Are you aware of any international funding agencies for food waste? So there's a lot of activity happening on food loss and waste. So. Actually, in the last section, I referenced those World Bank country diagnostics that was funded by the World Bank. Um, a lot of the development agencies are funding these sorts of activities, um, as well as various UN agencies. So there is funding out there. There actually has been, there have been pushes for more private sector finance on food loss and waste reduction in recent years. Um, I think this would go back to our global progress area of we, we just haven't seen enough of it yet so it's out there but um, countries and companies and smallholders generally have to be somewhat entrepreneurial about finding that that yeah. funding yeah um, yeah, from a personal point of view, I uh, I think it's sometimes easier to find funding for for uh, streams where there is an EPR system or something in place, unlike for plastics than for food waste, uh, which right. makes it sometimes a little bit more hard to 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 set up projects on it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks. Um, shall we move to the last part, Brian? Yes, let's. So in this last portion, I'm going to talk about the 10 by 20 by 30 initiative and how it sort of follows from the, the standard into some actions that companies are taking. So the 10 by 20 by 30 initiative, the idea here is that um, we really wanted to scale up the private sector's contribution to this SDG 12.3 goal of cutting food loss and waste in half because, you know, the, the private sector handles so much of the food and makes up so much of the food system. And so the idea behind this initiative was that at least 10 of the world's largest food retailers and providers, and you can see their logos on the right hand side of the screen, um, follow that target measure act approach and then engage 20 of their own suppliers to do the same to cut food loss and waste in half within their operations by 2030. And so the idea here is that it ends up being almost sort of a, a snowball effect where you start at this retail portion of the supply chain and then you move back up towards the manufacturing and production side of the supply chain. So trying to implement a whole chain approach rather than just looking at little bits and pieces throughout. And so again, this is the that Target Measure Act approach. And so the companies in this initiative, we asked them to adopt Target 12.3, measure and share their results publicly, and then start taking action. 
And so this is, I'm obviously not going to go through every single one of these companies, but these are all the participants in 10 by 20 by 30 over these sets of two slides. So it's become quite a um, global initiative. And what we do in this initiative is that we work with the participants, the companies to go through a series of trainings and interactions amongst their, their peers to learn how to implement Target Measure Act within their own business, um, within their own operations. And instead of each company doing it on their own, they're getting the benefits and the reassurance of doing it um, with other companies across their own sector, across the supply chain, and really looking for those synergies where they can um, work with other companies for a positive outcome of reducing this food loss and waste. And so the, the participants find that they save money within their operations because it's more efficient. Um, it's a positive profile to be seen as um, taking on food waste. And uh, generally, we we found that companies are finding this to be positive, both from a social perspective and from a business perspective. So when they participate, they don't. There's no fee for it. We're not. Um, I'm not making any money off of this. It's really just about trying to make sure that uh, we're getting a global movement in this issue. And so we've been very fortunate to have as many companies involved as we have. And so just to give you a sense of what some of these companies are doing. Um, so Campbell's is an American company that uh, manufactures soups and other food products. And so they've actually managed to cut food loss and waste in half in their facilities by 36% since 2017. So that's pretty significant. Um, and they've done it in pretty straightforward sorts of ways. So one of the things they've done is that they've repurposed previously, quote, wasted food to make new items. And this can be just as simple as taking breadcrumbs that were previously thrown out and realizing, oh, if we toast these, we can sell them as breadcrumbs and create a new product line from that. Um, and then instead of sending food loss and waste to a landfill, they've been able to re-divert it towards um, destinations like animal feed. So keeping it within the food supply chain. Um, Grupo Bimbo, which is a large bakery chain um, or large bakery manufacturer. So what they've done is they've actually managed to reduce food loss and waste by 32% in Central America and um, by less elsewhere, but still significant changes. And they've launched an internal war on waste to cut food waste in half in their organization. So what they've been doing is that once one facility discovers a best practice to help reduce that food waste, they disseminate, they disseminate that globally. And there's actually a real-time dashboard where they share all of their food loss and waste data internally. And they also work with a mobile app, Too Good To Go, that you may have heard of, that helps them to sell products that are close to expiration on a secondary market. So still helping it to reach people before it can go to waste. Um, and then Kikoman is a Japanese company that produces soy sauce and other soy products. And what's really neat, I think, about what they they do is that they actually only have a 0.4% rate of food loss and waste within their operations. And that's because they reuse so many of the byproducts of their production. So the byproducts of their soy sauce production is repurposed into things like nutritional products, nutri nutritional supplements, into fertilizer, into animal feeds, and even to power the boilers in their manufacturing facility that then help to make the next batch of products. And so the results to date of this 10 by 20 by 30 initiative, we have 223 companies participating and counting. Um, they've all adopted that Target Measure Act approach. Um, they're all aiming towards that 50% reduction goal. And where we are at this point is that the majority of them have set their baseline, meaning they've set what year they're going to compare it to where they're trying to cut that 50% against. And as we've seen from those examples, 
uh, many of them are already starting to take action to reduce food loss and waste. So this is just one example of an initiative that's helping to drive some of this further action. There's also a number of country level um, public private partnerships that are forming to help um, drive sort of private sector action on food loss and waste. And um, it's I think this is the sort of approach we're going to see be more effective going forward, not just in food waste, but in other areas where instead of companies seeing this as a competitive issue or something where there's a competitive advantage, it's more about uh, working together and moving down the road as a sector or as a, um, yeah, as a sector. So this is still something that's in progress. We're actually starting a second phase of companies participating in 10 by 20 by 30. Um, we actually just started a few weeks ago. So this is something that's going to be ongoing and hopefully we're going to keep uh, roping in more and more participants who um, will be able to help implement this worldwide. And so I think, yeah, we're down to our last few minutes. Um, so it looks like the timing was good in terms of the, the content. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Yeah, yeah we, we figured that out quite well, yes, thanks. Uh, um, uh, just before I close off, just one final question from the audience and then, then yeah. we'll move to uh, to the summary area. And uh, the final question is, is that uh, what are your insights on, or do you have any interesting insights on multinational companies which based on region so is there a difference between the regions uh, in, in the world on uh, do you, uh, what are your comments to that? That's a that's a really interesting question. So, so far, I've not seen regional differences. Um, the main insight that I've seen is that uh, companies tend to think that they are already doing everything they could be doing, but they are very set in their ways. So they're very used to an op way of operating and they say, this is the way we've always done it. It works. We don't need to change that. Um, and so I'd say that's actually the big insight that I found is that once companies start doing this target measure act approach, they re-examine some ways of doing things and find a new interesting way to do it. And it's not, it's usually not something really expensive or elaborate, it's usually something quite simple in terms of, oh, we were throwing out this product that can just be made into something else. So I'd say that's, I haven't seen the regional distinctions. I've seen actually more similarities than differences in terms of how companies tend to approach this issue. Okay, okay, great. Well, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, just uh, to summarize it for, on the content for me uh, personally in one sentence is that what I really found interesting is that you were talking about the why, the how and the what. And that's a model which I always use, but now I can extend it into it's not only about the why, the how and the what, but also about reporting about those. So uh, I, I think that's a great insight, which I learned at least for, uh, for for which I can not only apply to food waste, but also to different uh, parts uh, of my work. So um, uh, thank you very much for your time and, and taking us through your inspiring journey. Uh, and, and your work for, for uh, World Resources Institute. I think it was, uh, you, you gave great insights. Uh, thank you to the audience for your attention and your questions. I think it was uh, nice to have such a Q&A section uh, three times. Um, and thank you, uh, Be Wastewise, for hosting this webinar and this series. Um, uh, it will be uh, online available as a replay in case that uh, that you want like to share it with your friends or with your uh, colleagues. Um, and uh, at beyondfoodways.com, uh, we have a blog where we also uh, um, uh, share the best practices and we'll share some of these uh, of these messages. Uh, Sweeta, can I give the last words to you, please? Thank you, Heis. Thank you, Heis. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian, that was a very good presentation. It was very insightful. I really yes. enjoyed listening to everything that you had to say today. Uh, thanks to our audience for being very, very engaged. It, it's always good to have a webinar where you have an audience who really wants to know what the speaker has to say. And for the audience, uh, you can find both Brian and Heis on LinkedIn in case you have any other follow-up questions, you have you wish to connect with them. And we have links to their website that's been put up 
on the chat box as well. So please, you can head there to read more about the reports. So thanks a lot to everyone. Good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you're at. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brian. Thanks Thank for you. Coming. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone.